going on everybody we just finished another installment of our series cruise control the subtitle is muzzle it you know it takes place in mark chapter 4. jesus along with some disciples they are passing through a body of water and on their journey to the other side they face a storm and the storm begins to intimidate the disciples but jesus does something very significant instead of talking about the storm he speaks to the storm and the storm ceases the amplified version says it was muzzled. That's amazing to me that no matter how loud your storm is, it can be muzzled. You got to check out the message. But before you check out the message, I want to just thank you for joining us on Sundays, whether you're online or whether you're in person, you make our Sunday experience dynamic. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, join Evangel Nation. I believe that we are better together and I believe God has something waiting for you in this community. Listen, do us a favor. If you enjoyed this message, make sure you share it with somebody. Make sure you like and make sure you subscribe. It helps us to get the word out. Know that we're praying for you. And until then, may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your heart and mind. Peace. Let's turn our Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Verse 35, I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. It's a familiar passage of scripture reads, On that same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So leaving the crowd, they took him with them, just as he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. And a fierce windstorm began to blow. And the waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern asleep with his head on the sailor's leather cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? He got up and sternly rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still, muzzled. And the wind died down as if it had grown weary. And there was at once a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith, confidence in me? They were filled with great fear and said to each other, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I'm going to continue talking from the subject title, Cruise Control. If I had to give it a subtitle, I would give the subtitle, Muzzle It. Muzzle It. Muzzle It. Guess the name of this series is Cruise Control. But I want to remind everyone that we are not on a cruise ship. I want to remind you that we are on a battleship fighting for the Lord. I want to raise something on today because as you look at the text, I believe that the power of the storm was not just in the water or simply in the wind, it was in the noise. In the noise. And in order to overcome your storm, you're going to need noise reduction. And noise reduction is the process of removing noise from a signal. You know, commands are considered. Signals. It was Armar 
Bose, who first thought about reducing noise in headphones during his flight to Europe. Listening to music was not an option because of the engine noise. So he dedicated time to the concept of building noise-canceling headphones that started right in a plane. And so the enemy's assignment is to interrupt the signal of God so that you can hear his voice. Isn't it amazing we call the device in which we enjoy music headphones, even though it's directed towards our ears? Because what you hear can affect your head. Because the Bible reminds us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. It's not that other noise is not going on or taking place. It's the fact that it is canceled. And there's some things you have to cancel so you can hear what God is saying. You know, in football, they have what they call the 12th man. Sometimes the 12th man is the referee. But sometimes the 12th man is the crowd. And the assignment of the crowd is to create noise. Maybe this is why Jesus, at the beginning of the text, he gets rid of the crowd and focuses on the crew. Because the noise is designed to disrupt the communication so that the football team, the opposing football team, will have a false start. Isn't it like the enemy that sometimes he allows us to hear so much noise so that we'll have a false start and have to endure a penalty because we jumped the gun? Y'all looking at me funny like you've never jumped the gun before. We're living in a society that's dealing with anxiety. Anxiety is when you're anxious and you lack patience. And so all of us have had moments where we jumped the gun because we couldn't hear God clearly. Come here, Abraham. Abraham jumps the gun because he knows God has a promise for him, but he produces an Ishmael because he can't hear God clearly. It takes discipline to stay put until you can hear God clearly. I got two class. Maybe we're still dealing with the residue of last season when we jumped the gun. But you have to understand that the enemy's assignment is to have miscommunication so that you're off size and receive penalties. Because I'm getting to the age where I can't afford another unnecessary setback. I know some of y'all so young, you, you don't even care anymore. But the truth of the matter is some of us are getting older and we realize that the penalties will keep us from achieving the assignment and the purpose and the goal that God has called us to achieve. And so we have to be disciplined enough, even with the noise, to listen for the voice. And when we can't hear the voice, we have to watch for the signals. So that we can appropriately respond to the play and the communication of the coach. I want to remind you, like both, the disciples hear some noise while they are traveling to the other side. I want you to know that in order for us to be successful, you have to make sure that you have certain people on your crew. You know, when we look at this boat, we understand that the disciples, um, they're going to the other side, and their crew is made up of a whole lot of people. In fact, the Bible again reminds us um, that they get rid of the crowd and bring the crew. It specifically lets us know that they take Jesus in their boat. Listen, if you're going to be successful, you got to make sure that Jesus is in your boat. There were other boats around, but Jesus was in one particular boat. And I want you to know, this is the reason I love going to a church like this. It's because you may be in a different boat, but every now and then we're going to face the same storm. 
Because these boats were not alone. They were in the same lake, even though they were in different boats. It was a little boat, which means little boats can make big impact when the Savior is in it. Some of y'all don't believe that the Savior can make a big difference. If you just have faith the size of the grain of a mustard seed, you can move mountains because God specializes in using small things. See, see, that's the problem because as long as you remain small, which is another word for humility, and then God can show his greatness, but he won't compete with anyone. Because his strength is perfected even in our weakness. And so they had different types of people on the ship. Because how many people know that sometimes the crew responds differently to the storm? All of us can face the same storm and respond totally different. You have crew members on the ship who are complaining because of the storm. I know you don't know anybody like that, but there are people that complain because of the storm. And then there were people that were bailing out. They were trying to get the water out of the ship back into the sea with buckets. And so they're working so hard that they're weary. And some of you came to church today, you are weary because of the storm you have been dealing with. Yeah, you're weary because you've been trying to get water out of your ship because you don't want to seek. And as you've been doing it, you've been losing strength and you've been losing fervor because you recognize that you're not on a cruise ship. You're not on carnival. You are in a battleship. I think that's important that we make that clear because sometimes we promote salvation like you won't ever go through a storm. But when I look at biblical text, I never see a ship without a storm. In fact, the ship was designed for the storm. So that's why it's important that you understand the ship because the truth of the matter is you may be in discipleship. You may be in a relationship, and if you think your relationship will never have to face a storm, then your relationship is probably not God-ordained. Because God will allow the enemy in the opposition to test, to see what you are made of. That's why some of you need to celebrate the fact that you're tested. Because God is not testing you to fail you. He's testing you to prove you. So we have people that are trying to bail out. Uh, but then we have a third group. These are the commanders. These are the commanders. These are not the suggestors. These are the commanders. In other words, they take authority over their situation. And I want you to know Jesus, our Lord, falls into this category. And if we are to be imitators of Christ, we too should fall into this category. If you're a commander, say, I'm a commander. Y'all didn't say it like y'all meant it. Y'all sound like y'all were complainers. I need you to talk like you a real commander and say, I am a commander. You got to talk with some authority if you're going to be a commander because some of you, the enemy has tried to wipe out all of your zeal, all of your passion. But I came here to remind you on this morning of who you are. You are a commander. That means when you speak, things change, things shift. Things turn around. You're talking about he turned it, but sometimes God's going to use your mouth to turn it. That's why you better be glad you sat beside me on this morning because God hears my prayer. Don't you hear what James is saying in James 5? The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avail of much. I can change your whole life. I got favor with God. If you know you're a commander, if you know you're a thermostat and not a thermometer, I want you to open your mouth and give God some praise.
Your sick bodies can't hang out with me because I'll command you to be healed. You can't be broke for long because I'll speak to your poverty and I'll command wealth to find you because I believe that life and death is in the power of my tongue. Don't y'all get me started. See, some of y'all came in with aches and pains, but I've learned how to command my body to bless the Lord. I'm not standing up because I got a good, nice rest. I'm standing up because he stood up for me. I've learned how to command. I want to see how many people got control over your own body to give God some praise on this morning. I command my mouth to give him glory. I command my hands to give him a wave offering. I command my feet to celebrate. He has made me glad, I will rejoice. Well, he has made me glad. Please be seated. See, when you're not a commander, you gotta feel the praise. But when you're a commander, you command your body. No, you won't start aching in praise and worship. You haven't ached all week long. Don't you start in praise and worship. Man, my eyes to stay open. You've been open all weekend. Went to the club on Friday because you didn't come to bowl conference. And now you're going to close your eyes? I command my body because I'm a commander. Paul says, I beat my body into submission because I'm a commander. And everybody needs a commander in your crew. Yeah, you, you don't want to go out to sea without a commander. You want somebody in your crew that can speak those things that are not as though they were. You want a commander. You, you want a commander that can get a hold of heaven when you're in the pit. You want a commander. A commander can do a lot of things. First of all, a commander can talk you into it. Listen, these disciples were not thinking about going to the other side. It was Jesus who suggests let us go to the other side. They didn't want to go and deal with the pagans and people that would contaminate them. But Jesus speaks to them and said, let's go to the other side. And since Jesus made the suggestion, they said it must be a good idea. They went to the other side because you can't be a commander if you don't have influence. Yeah, I want to submit this to you that many times you hear the most noise while traveling to a destination. See, when you're making movement, you're going to hear noise. It wasn't until the disciples decided to follow Jesus that they started to hear noise. When you're driving in a car, you're going to hear noise. When you're riding on a bike, you're going to hear noise. When you're flying in an airplane, you're going to hear noise. When you're making big moves, you're going to hear noise. Oh, see, some of y'all don't understand that. This is why some of us have become stagnant because of the noise that we heard while we were making the move. But you can't do anything significant and not hear noise. And so these men are going from one side to the other side and they hear noise. Some of you just got saved and you're moving from one place to another place and you're saying, Pastor, I'm hearing so much noise. Because the enemy always sends noise as a means of encouraging you to let you know you're making progress. Because most of the time when we hear noise, we stop. But just like Bose heard the noise while he was traveling to Europe, you're going to hear noise while you're traveling. But I want to remind you that all noise is not evil. But some noises help us to sleep and relax. See, some of y'all don't have a baby like me. I have a baby. Her name is Baby Paige. It's amazing that when Paige first came home, every night 
were nursery rhymes. I got tired of hearing Mary had a little lamb. But what most scientists discover, there's a noise we call white noise. That white noise does something contrary to other types of noises. White noise has the ability to make you relax during the day and sleep great at night. This makes me wonder what type of noise Jesus was listening to on the same ship. Maybe it wasn't that he wasn't hearing noise. He was just hearing a different noise. And some people are trying to figure out why you can be so relaxed and why you can be so calm and why you're not sweating like everybody else and why you're not losing your mind. It's because you're marching to a beat of a different drum. I got to preach to somebody. You got the same diagnosis they got, but you still giving God praise. You still are handling your business. You still are loving your family because you hear something else. They hear doom. You hear he was wounded for my transgressions and he was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we're healed. Look at somebody say, I marched to the beat of a different drum. You really can't be a commander if you don't march to the beat of a different drum. You remember when Israel invaded Canaan? They realized the promised land. They realized that they looked like grasshoppers. But there was a commander in the group by the name of Joshua that said, I don't see things like y'all see things because I'm marching to the beat of a different drum. You all see yourself as grasshoppers, but I see us as more than able because I know the God that we serve. And you need somebody on your boat that when they hear the wind, they're not giving in, but they recognize there's something that supersedes the wind and that's the Holy Spirit. And when everybody else is speaking death, they are speaking life. I just want to know, are there any commanders here that recognize that you're not a prisoner of your circumstances, but you got an anointing to see things differently? Everybody else sees two fish and five loaves of bread, but I see the potential of what can happen when I put it in the master's hands. Everybody else sees a Goliath, but what I see is an opportunity for God to get glory. So I'm going to wind up my slingshot and I'm going to take Goliath down because I'm not just an occupant on this boat. I'm a commander. I can't have prophesied to somebody that when you go back to work, you're not just an employee, you're a commander. I pray God gives you special favor that you command attention from your boss, from your CEO, from those that are in authority because of the anointing that's on your life. Even if they don't like you, they're going to have to recognize you because of the favor that's on your life. commanders see differently it was Joshua who, who, who felt like he was running out of time let me preach to somebody I said it was Joshua who felt like he was running out of time Joshua says no way I'm gonna win this battle because I'm running out of time I'm talking to everybody 50 and up feel like you running out of Joshua said, I'm not going out like that because I'm a commander. He says, I can even command the sun. He says, sun, be still. Do you believe you have such an anointing that God wants to spend time on your behalf? He said, because I got to defeat this enemy and I can't defeat the enemy in the night. I need daylight. So I'm going to command my circumstances to conform to the will of God. Maybe the reason you're losing some battles is because you don't recognize who you are. See, I'm a commander. I'll try to whisper it the rest of the service. But you're a commander. You're a commander. See, some saints come here looking depressed, looking defeated. That's why nobody wants your Christ. 
Because if you got to conform to the circumstances the same way I'm conformed to the circumstances, then something's not right. That's why the Bible says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can have Christianity and have the same old mind. But I'm asking God to change my mind because when he changes my mind, he'll change my speech. Because I'm a commander and you don't want to be going in the Sea of Galilee in a storm if you can identify the commander in your crew. And I wouldn't bet on somebody else. That's why you better make sure it's you. Because every crew needs a commander. Because you're not on a cruise ship. You on a battleship. And battles need commanders. See, we don't sing songs like this. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord anymore. Because we don't believe it's a good fight anymore. But when you're in a fight, a commander will get you through a hard time. See, when we call Jesus a wonderful counselor, we're not talking about the one that allows you to sit on his couch. We're talking about one that's designed for war times to give you strategy to overcome the enemy. That's what a wonderful counselor is. And some of you are in the fight of your life. And I came to tell you, you came to the right place because Jesus can make it all right. Let me slow it down. Feeling like a general this morning. Let me slow it down. And I'm glad y'all talking. Because commanders are not afraid to speak up. So they talk us into it. Watch this. Then they talk to it. They talk to it. Watch this. Not about it. So you know you a commander when you don't talk about the circumstance more than you talk to it. There's some people that can tell you what's going wrong in their life. They can give you their whole life story from A to Z. But the truth of the matter is they never talk to their circumstance. When I look at the disciples in the scripture, they're talking about the storm, but they never once talk to the storm. And you talk about cancer, when the last time you talked to it? Yeah, yeah, you're talking about your, your worsome kids, but when's the last time you talked to your worsome kids and commanded that their life began to conform? See, you know you're a coward when you talk about people and won't talk to people. You got to have a knuck if you buck type of attitude. I said, listen, I ain't never scared. If I say it in private, I'll say it to your face. That's the type of attitude you have to have. But to be having private conversations and when you get out in public, you smile in their face. It's just proof you a coward and I'll kick them off my boat. You're not a commander if you can't say it to their face. And Jesus was trying to show the disciples the difference between being a coward and a commander. He says, I'm not going to talk about the storm like the storm can't hear me. I'm going to talk to the storm. And why are you talking about what you could talk to? The reason they made you the manager is because you're supposed to be able to speak to the problem and not just talk about the problem. The reason you a CEO is not just to talk to the problem. I'm talking about the problem, but to talk to the problem because you are a commander. Because whether you like it or not, the storm is talking to you. You might as well talk back to the storm. I'm going to show you in scripture that storms are not silent. Storms talk to you. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. 
Storms talk to you. So you got to talk through it. You know how no storms talk to you? Because watch this. As soon as the disciples wake Jesus up, they don't ask him to help them. They say, Lord, do you care if we perish? What the storm was telling them is God doesn't care. So they're responding to storm talk. If you've ever been in a real storm, you know it makes you question whether God cares or not. Some of you got an attitude with God on this morning because of the storm that you're in. But you can allow the storm to talk to you without talking back to the storm. Look at your neighbor. I got an attitude. I'm about to talk back on this Sunday. I talk back to everybody else. I might as well talk back to this storm. You're not going to push me in the corner. You're not going to give me suicidal thoughts. I'm going to push back because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I still got a bad attitude. I know how to use it for good now. I curse you out in the spirit. Some of y'all got all this attitude for the saints and no attitude for Satan. No, you won't take my family. I draw the line. I know the storm says I'm not going to bounce back from this sickness, but the devil is a liar and a deceiver too. God's not through blessing me. Look at somebody say, this season you got to talk back. The last sickness said it was going to take you out, but did it? No, it didn't. Thanks be to God that always causes us to try to you a little secret. Whatever the enemy tells you, believe the opposite. So when he tells you you're not going to make it, that's just prophecy that I'm going to make it. And not only am I going to make it, I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm going to make it with more than enough. When people prophesy and say people are leaving, it's just prophecy that people are coming. Because sometimes God will let wrong people leave so right people can come. The devil couldn't tell the truth if he tried. And the problem is we don't talk. The reason David was victorious, because he talked back to Goliath. He said, how dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the name of the living God. I'm not a coward. I'm a commander. How dare my pockets stay broke and I tithe and I'm a good steward and I got a job and I'm liberal. How dare command my hand to line up with my heart because I'm a commander. You know, Joseph, Joshua is a boss. Commanders speak for everybody. He said, as for me and my house. I don't even know if they got to sign up. He spoke for everybody. That means you can speak for your whole family when you're a commander. This sickness won't touch my family. It's getting out of our bloodline because I'm not just an observer. I'm a commander. The worst place to act like a coward is when you're on the battlefield. Pastor, what if I lose? At least you had a great talk game. Can I help y'all out? Some of y'all can't fight worth the lick. But the reason you never had to get into a fight is because you have a great talk game. 
And people don't want to test you to see if you can back up the way you talk. See, I just got two knobs. I'm going to walk away and I'm going to kill you. Two knobs. If I snap, I'm just snapped. Sometimes the enemy will leave you alone if you just talk right. Because every fight that Jesus won, he won the war words. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out the mouth of God. He responded to the enemy's attacks with word. Yeah. You know, I had never been scared. I remember uh, at UNCG when I was uh, walking after a Bible study. And somebody threw a bottle and hit me in the back of my head. They were on the pickup truck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know what I was saying? It was five of them in that truck. I said, turn around. I'll take all five of y'all. I said, I'll kill y'all. And you know what? I didn't even count them. I just snapped. They never turned around. I just believe the Spirit of God would have come upon me in a mighty way. We would have hanged it. Some of you allow the enemy to just disrupt your whole life and you never say anything back. Look at somebody say, talk back. Watch this. There were whole armies that abandoned their camp because of a noise. Look what happened to the lepers. For the Lord made the Syrian army hear a noise of chariots and horses, the noise of a great army. They had said to one another, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to come upon us. So they hear footsteps. Don't you know God moves your enemy out the way by allowing them to hear noises? You haven't even said nothing to them, but God in their dreams allows them to hear footsteps. And because they hear footsteps, they abandon all of their spoils. But then God reveals to David that I'm the God of the breakthrough. So he says, when you hear the noise, then you attack. See, when you're a believer, when you hear noise, there's two different responses. Unbelievers run from noise, and believers run to noise. So how do you respond when you hear the noise? Hear the noise. Hear the noise. Hear the noise. Hear the noise. Because you're not going to have praisers without criticism. I learned that people can love and hate you in the same room. They can experience the same thing in the same message as Jesus and Judas. He got everything the other disciples got, but he received it wrong. Because you can't be great without noise. I just wish people would stop talking about me. Then that would abort your greatness. Because sometimes the biggest publicity stunt is your enemies. By this, I know that you favored me, that my enemies don't triumph over me. When my enemies came to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. It was the enemies that talked about Joseph to Pharaoh. It's going to be your enemies that give you your next promotion. Let me preach to somebody. Can I take a prophetic moment? It's those people that talk about you. It's going to be the reason you're going to get to Jesus. When the people told Bartimaeus, leave Jesus alone, Jesus said, tell him to come here. I want you to know your enemies are about to sponsor your next blessing. They didn't believe that. The Bible says he'll make your enemy 
your footstool. I came to prophesy to somebody that's been dealing with somebody very, very annoying. God's about to show you that you're very, very anointing. And you about to go to another level. And I take that prophet, I, I, I prophesy to you that the person that talked about you, God's going to make them bring you your gift of deliverance. Because he wants to show you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And because you didn't run from the noise, but you ran to the noise, God's about to open up the windows of heaven and pull you out of blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. If you believe it, give God some glory right now. That's your prophetic moments. It was Egypt that gave Israel all their wealth because the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the... Your, your opposition is about to sponsor your next blessing. It was the weight that sponsored your muscle. Sometimes the things we don't like is the thing that's going to sponsor what we do like. Please be seated. So you got to talk through it. Somebody say, talk through it. Commanders talk through it. Then talk over it. I love what the voice says. The voice says that Jesus raised his voice. So that's why I know that sound was an issue. That noise was an issue because the disciples had to speak over the storm. And when Jesus commands the storm, he raises his voice. There's some things that are talking to you, but the most disrespectful thing you can do back to it is talk over it. And the Bible says this, that when they talk over it, that God causes the wind to grow weary. That when he speaks peace, be still, the wind, the opposition grows weary. Weary. When grew tired of making noise. Wow. I came to prophesy to somebody, you on your final lap because the thing that's been opposing you is about to grow tired of making noise. The Bible even goes deeper and says the wind died. The waves stopped. Can I prophesy to you some more? That the wind died before the disciples. The disciples thought they were going to die, but the thing that was opposing them died before the disciples. I came to prophesy to you, the thing that you think is going to kill you, is going to die before you do. And the Bible says that the waves stopped. So when the wind died, the waves stopped. The waves stopped before the disciples did. See, if you can outlive the storm... You'll be able to testify of God's goodness of how he brought you out into the marvelous light. Because somebody said, you can't stop. You can't stop. And the text says, if you look at the Amplified, it says that Jesus commands peace. And the Bible says that he muzzles the storm. Hush, be still. It was muzzle. You experience peace when your storm is muzzled. Peace muzzles your storm. I said peace comes when you muzzle your storm. Peace is not automatic. It comes... When you muzzle your storm. So you can decide when you will have peace. You said I've been looking for peace. God said go get your muzzle. See when they can talk. And you either distance yourself from them. Or you begin to minimize the weight of what they say. 
then you're minimizing and muzzling the storm. You got to learn how to drown out one noise and start listening to another noise. You got to muzzle it out. Because peace comes when you muzzle the storm. That must mean the storm has a mouth. Because you don't muzzle something that doesn't have a mouth. I told you the storm is going to talk to you. And you have to muzzle the storm because it has a mouth. And not only does the storm have a mouth, but the storm has a bite. And some of you, that's why you feel like you're just partial right now. You don't feel like yourself because the storm took a bite out of you. God said in this season, you got to muzzle the storm. You know that some people that's done things to you, the more you think about it, you can go into a state of depression. Just thinking about certain things. And God's saying, listen, I want to deliver you, but you got to get the muzzle out. He's been gone for 15 years and you're still reading his love letters. You need to muzzle those letters. I'll come over and have a bonfire with you. You, you, you need to muzzle those letters. You're looking over his text messages like I believe. You need to get rid of those text messages. You, you need to start a new Facebook profile. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. You got to learn how to muzzle those things. Some of you got to get a new phone number so you can muzzle. Because sometimes the storm comes through your phone. You on Instagram getting depressed because you don't like a model. You need to unfollow some people. You need to muzzle the storm. Like you felt good about yourself until you saw somebody else. You got to muzzle. You were content with your hoopty till you saw a bitly. You got to... Godly contentment is gain. You got to learn how to muzzle. Because evil communication corrupts good behavior. When you're a commander, you know how to muzzle the storm. I never forget it. There was a time somebody was in my ear and they never had anything positive to say. I remember one day I walked in. I won't tell you where I walked in because you try to figure out who it is. I walked in and I heard the Holy Spirit say just as clear as day, don't listen to another word they have to say. Whatever they say, believe the opposite. I muzzled them because I found myself going home every day depressed. And that's why you got to be careful who you give access to your ear. I'm prophesying somebody. Somebody's in a relationship now. He, he tears you down so you won't leave. And then when you do leave, he tries to build you up again. And so you're in a cycle because you haven't muzzled him. Because every time you connect with him, he takes a bite out of you. Until you feel like you're nothing. Some of you got to muzzle your failures. You got to launch out into the deep. Because they're telling you because you haven't been successful yet means you will never be successful. And that's a lie from the enemy. You got to muzzle the storm. You got to muzzle them when you know God has put you together with your husband and your single friend saying, girl, if that was me. That's why it's never going to be you. You got to muzzle That's the trick of the enemy to get married people to compare their life to the single life. And then single people are frustrated because they're comparing themselves to the married life. Hey. So you got to be a commander. And peace only comes when you muzzle. What are you going to turn down this week so you can turn up something else? The reason Jesus could sleep is because he had already muzzled the storm. He just muzzled it for the disciples. 
when you grow in God, you can sleep in the worst time of your life. Because peace doesn't need your understanding. He gives you the peace that surpasses all understanding and it guards your heart and your mind. Some of y'all going to sleep right now and don't even know how you getting rest. You know they lying on you, but you getting the best sleep you ever had because you can feel the presence of the Lord. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Some of y'all own the tightest budget you've ever been on, but you got more joy than you've ever had before because he's giving you peace that surpasses all under. You going to the doctor's office ministering to him because he's giving you peace that surpasses all understanding. You know, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be a towel this in, but, you know, uh, I, I picked up this game the other day. It's called Battleship. My, my wife brought in my mail. She's like, did you order a game? I was like, it's Battleship. Because I wanted to communicate to you all that we are not on a cruise ship. We're on a Battleship. And your crew has to know that. I love Battleship because there's a wall set up. It's a board set up. And watch this, the commander is on one side of the board, commanding things on the other side of the board. This is what you got to understand. Just because I can't see the other side does not mean I can't make impact on the other side. This is what Battleship tells me. So I can prophesy and speak to my present based upon what I've seen in my future. Because I'm a commander. Yeah, even though I can't see where I'm going, I still can say where I'm going. Commander and battleship teaches us something else. He teaches us that just because I'm hit doesn't mean I'm sunk. Y'all need to go get battleship and play it this afternoon. I said, just because I'm hit doesn't mean I'm sunk. Because one of the rules of battleship is that when you're hit, you got to tell people, I'm hit. But just because I'm hit does not mean I'm sunk. Some of you are like the disciples. Just because you got hit by a storm, you think it's the end. You think it's over. You think you're sunk. But the truth of the matter is you're just hit. And many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. Find somebody say, I've been hit, but I'm still standing. I took the licking and kept on ticking because God has been faithful to me. A just man falls seven times, but he gets back up because I might have been hit, but I'm not saint. And I came in to prophesy to somebody, you can get back up on this morning. You don't have to stay in the state that you're in. I came to prophesy to you that the potter wants to put you back together. Again, look at somebody with your commander voice and say, get back up. Y'all got to say like y'all got some oil on that. Tell them to get back up. You've been hit, but the proof you're not sunk is that you're here today. Look at somebody say, I made some mistakes, but God's grace has been sufficient. And I'm here to celebrate that he's kept me through the midst of it all. Unless y'all think I'm just trying to work. Y'all want to talk to the brothers because sometimes the brothers like, man, I get all this celebration. The enemy will make you think it's over when it's just intermission. I'm hit, but he couldn't sink me. Watch this. The Bible says that the boat was full of water, but it never said it began to sink. Because just because you're hit doesn't mean you're going We've all been hit. Some of us have been hit with sickness. Some of us have been hit with job loss. Some of us have been hit with betrayal. 
But I came to tell you that you have not sunk. I learned this from battleship. Just because I lost a ship or a battle does not mean I've lost the war. God never promised that you wouldn't lose a battle. But he did promise you would win the war. Jesus looked like he lost the battle when he went to Calvary. But he got up on third day to prove to us that he won. God told me to tell somebody, let me keep count. You might have lost some battles, but according to my calculations, you can still win the war. You can lose a ship and still win in battleship. Some of y'all counting what you lost. And God says, I'm counting what I can do with what you lost. So take no thought. Because I never lost the game. And in battleship, you can lose some battles. But that doesn't mean you've lost the game. 